God not only knows the future, but actually has designed the future for us. Carvings in the temple. And temple decorations. It is time for the Quick Study Television program. It is a good day to read the Bible. Stay there and join us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Jen. And I'm Corey. Hey, welcome to the Quick Study Television Program. As I said off the beginning, it is a good day to read the Bible. It is. And we're in this amazing book called Ezekiel. A lot of people get confused about Ezekiel, but there's a lot of things we can learn in today's world to help us understand. Uh, let me give you an example. God is omnipotent, means he knows the future as well. So God not only knows the future, but did you know that according to Ezekiel, and we'll talk about this later, God also has designed the future for each of us. And so there's a lot of sovereignty involved. Going to be an interesting day. Corey has Bible archaeology. Corey? Okay, well, we know that in the future temple, the palm tree is going to be used. So we're taking a look at the symbolism behind specifically palm fronds or palm branches. Very interesting. Talking, of course, about the Millennium Temple yes. that Ezekiel sees and yes. measures and so on. And Janice, our Bible challenge is what? There's a lot of details that I could pull from, but here's the question what was carved throughout the temple all around pomegranates and cherubim palm trees and lions or palm trees and cherubim this and more coming up as we continue to study through the amazing book of ezekiel stay there reports that the family, husband and wife, daughter and son, is God's idea. To have husband and wife guiding and protecting children is an institution from the divine mind, not the contrivance of man's society. The original Hebrew term for wife is synonymous with woman. But the idea is that the wife is the guard of the family or the rear guard of the husband. The husband cannot grow the family properly without the wife, and the wife cannot protect the family well without the husband. In the Bible, marriage was complementive, not competitive. Get your quick study pocket guide. Go through the Bible with us. Write P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. We are viewer supported, and if you'd be kind enough to pray about what God would have you do, remember we are supported by gifts from people just like you. Again, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. this show today. At first, I wasn't really sure what I was going to talk about because our reading today is Ezekiel chapters 40 through 42, and these are all talking about the future temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem but isn't there right now. So I was thinking, how am I going to do archaeology on something that doesn't exist yet? But what I decided to do with you today is actually just take a look at the city of Jerusalem itself and explore the remnants of the temple uh, that are there right now. The temple is gone, so really the only remnants have been found beside the Temple Mount in archaeological excavations. There's been lots of uh, kingly signet seals found there. And also underneath the Temple Mount is also pretty cool. So come take a look with me at this ancient city of Jerusalem. 
Although the physical archaeological record of early Jerusalem is still relatively quiet, we are able to glean rich hints and information from historically contemporary sources, like the Amarna letters. These let us know that Jerusalem, called Jebus, was an important, royal, fortified city before the days of King David. Second Samuel records how David and his army commander Joab enter this fortified city by sneaking in through a sort of water access shaft or tunnel. Until recently, archaeologists believed that they had found that very shaft in what they call the Warren's shaft. Now they are reassessing, but the conquering via water shaft is not in question. Archaeology has shown it probable and realistic. Exciting and controversial are the excavations still going on underneath and around the Temple Mount complex. Archaeologists working here are smack dab in the middle of King Solomon's original handiwork. Underground chambers, walkways, ritual baths for Israel's priests, and even possible connection passageways to the royal palace. An underground stable and holding pen for animals was found near the edge of the Temple Mount complex. Unfortunately, this has since been destroyed by vandals of history. Today our reading assignment from the Bible Guide is Ezekiel 40 to 42. A note to all Bible students. The study today happens 12 years since the six messages of hope were delivered after the fall of Jerusalem in 588, 588 BC. So it's after, 25 years after the deportation of Judas King Jehoiakim. That according to 2 Chronicles 36, 9 and 10. So to be counted by a calendar, our calendar, the time of this city's temple vision was 573 BC. Now this is the time of Daniel. This is the time of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. According to some scholars, this is also the same year that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar went insane, according to Daniel 4. At this time, Ezekiel sees a vision of Jerusalem in the future and the temple in Jerusalem. And from the description, we know that it is not the Jerusalem of the first century, but some distant future city, which God is the reigning king of. This is fascinating. Ezekiel 40, verses 1 through 16. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it, toward the south, was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and fix your mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show them to you. Declare to the house of Israel everything you see. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth, and he measured the width of the wall structure one rod, and the height one rod. Then he went to the gateway which faced east, and he went up its stairs and measured the threshold of the gateway, which was one rod wide, and the other threshold was one rod wide. Each gate chamber was one rod long and one rod wide. Between the gate chambers was a space of five cubits, and the threshold of the gateway by the vestibule of the inside gate was one rod. 
He also measured the vestibule of the inside gate, one rod. Then he measured the vestibule of the gateway, eight cubits, and the gate posts, two cubits. The vestibule of the gate was on the inside. In the eastern gateway were three gate chambers on one side and three on the other. The three were all the same size. Also, the gate posts were of the same size on this side and that side. He measured the width of the entrance to the gateway, 10 cubits, and the length of the gate, 13 cubits. There was a space in front of the gate chambers, one cubit on this side and one cubit on that side. The gate chambers were six cubits on this side and six cubits on that side. Then he measured the gateway from the roof of one gate chamber to the roof of the other. The width was 25 cubits as door faces door. He measured the gate posts, 60 cubits high, and the court all around the gateway extended to the gate post. From the front of the entrance gate to the front of the vestibule of the inner gate was 50 cubits. There were beveled window frames in the gate chambers and in their intervening archways on the inside of the gateway all around and likewise in the vestibules. There were windows all around on the inside and on each gatepost were palm trees. Ezekiel chapter 40 verses 1 through 16. You know, windows were really unique. There, there weren't any windows in the Holy of Holies. There weren't any windows really in the tabernacle or the temple, yet we see them here. Now, one of the more unique twists of God's revelation is that it is not nebulous or cloudy. There are specifics. Now, it may seem that way to those who have not studied the Word of God. They might say, well, the Word is just an allegory because there's no specifics in it. But the word prophesies keys to knowing prophecies in it. In other words, the Word gives us keys to understanding God's Word. Signs and types, for example. And we always use the Bible to interpret the Bible. The spirit of analogy, it's called in seminary. Any other interpretation comes from the mind of man, which is flawed with sin because his, his mind is dark. In the next set of chapters, Ezekiel is given a very specific measurement task with specific sets of order. This does not look like an allegory to me. Uh, this is not to test our geometry or our calculus skills, although you could try that, but it's to remind us that God is the ultimate designer with very specific instructions to designate how we should live. You know, God is not nebulous. God doesn't say, well, I think I'll create the earth, sort of. Or I think I'll create man, kind of. No, he says, earth come forth. Man, stand up out of the dust. Uh, breath of life, you know, Jesus didn't say, be healed, maybe halfway. No, he said, be healed. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, well, to the man who's lying by the pool of Bethesda, well, get up a little bit. He said, stand up, man, and pick up your mat. Confirm your healing. Wow. And so here in 40... It says this, chapters 40, verses 1 to 3. In the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, that's very specific, in the 14th year after the city was captured, on the very same day the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. And in the visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain, on, uh, and on it toward the south was something like a structure of a city. And he took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. And he had a line of flax, a measuring rod in his hand. And he stood in the gateway. This is truth to live by, number one. God not only knows the future, beloved, but he has measured the future. He has designed the future for you and I. I mean, it's for specific. It's not like, I think I'll make the temple, sort of. Oh, it doesn't matter half an inch, half an inch there. No, he's very specific. And God doesn't say to you and to me, I think I'll heal you, kind of. No, he says, you are healed. You are alive. You have been dead. Now you're alive. And so God is very specific, and he's not like us. doesn't cut corners. doesn't have to cut corners. He makes the corners. 
And so verse 4 of chapter 40 says, And the man said to me, Son of dust, look with your eyes, hear with your ears. Not only that, but fix your mind on this, meditate on this, focus on this, concentrate on this. I will show you, for you were brought here that I might show them to you. Declare this to the house of Israel, everything you see. Now this brings us to the second truth to live by. God desires all of his children to know his plan for the future. God is not a God of conspiracy. He's not like planning some conspiracy that we got to get Agent Moeller and Scully in the X-Files to go figure out what it is. He's not doing that. He doesn't require CSI investigators to discover the valley of the dry bones. God is specific. He knows what he's doing and he wants us to know. Now granted, it's true. Uh, I've tried to figure out what Ezekiel's patterns mean. So I, I, some people have made, I, this one guy, made an entire village of the measurements on Ezekiel. i got to give that guy credit. That took a long time. It took him six years. Wow. But still, we have no clues just yet because we're missing something. But we'll talk about that later on in the program in the back end segment with Corey and Janice. But let's go on to chapter 40, verse 5. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple. In the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And he measured the width of the wall structure, one rod and the height of one rod. Now here again, my only point is God's revelation is not obscure or nebulous. It is very direct, identifiable, and accessible. You're going to ask me what this means. I don't know yet. I have no idea yet. I've got some conjectures. I've got some theories. But what I hear through this, I believe what's happening here is there's something being designed yet not revealed. When it is revealed in God's perfect timing, we have to wait for it. We have to wait on the Lord. We have to wait for it. And don't get impatient and fill in your own ideas like so many people do. I know who the Antichrist is. Well, they're filling in their own ideas because they're not waiting on the Lord. And so what I do see here, however, is that God is very precise. He is very determined. He is an excellent carpenter, a perfect skilled craftsman, and he has crafted your healing and my healing. He has crafted your future and my future with divine hands. And God needs no tools. He has the tool of his word, for he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. So, beloved, today remember the God you serve is a perfect God in your future. as I was going through Ezekiel uh, chapter 40 through 42 and reading about the temple, something that really stuck out to me that never really had before was the mention of palm trees. Did you catch that as you were reading through it? It talks about palm trees uh, being uh, on the pillars of the doorways into uh, the courts and into the temple itself. Now, when you go back to the original plans for the temple found in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, we find three decorations. We find pomegranates, we find palm trees, and we find cherubim, which are angels, and those were decorating uh, the, the, the tabernacle and, and eventually the, the temple as well. But here, it specifically only mentions palm trees. So, we are going to take a look at the symbolism of the palm tree. Palm branches used in symbolism appear in the Bible, in Jewish, Greek and Roman cultures. They seem to signify victory, the celebration of victory, and in Jewish culture, they are used to praise the Lord. According to Jewish tradition, palm branches were and are a key component in recitation of Psalm 118. John chapter 12 records the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem telling us that the people who welcomed him were waving palm branches and reciting parts of Psalm 118. During the Maccabean period, palm branches were used in the ceremony to rededicate the temple. Jewish coins that have been minted have also made use of the palm branch in place of a leader's name or face. 
The coins during the Maccabean period read, for the redemption of Zion, with an image of a palm branch. It is no secret to Bible readers that palm branches will be employed in the future. Revelation chapter 7 incorporates palm branches in the praises of a multitude of people standing before God's throne. Every day, in many ways, you are being lied to. Quick Study Television and Bible Discovery TV present this amazing documentary movie called The 12 Biggest Lies, featuring people like Dr. Ravi Zacharias, Kirby Anderson, Calvin Smith, Richard Thangard of Creation Ministries International, Dr. Chuck Misler, Ray Comfort, and many more. Hosted by Kevin Sorbo, this 12 Biggest Lies movie answers many questions that people wonder about the Bible and about the world and society around us. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's the meaning to life? What happens after I die? Even the most radical biblical scholars and historians I believe that Jesus certainly exists. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. What I believe to be true is going to alter my everyday life. For your copy of The 12 Biggest Lies, send $20 or more to Quick Study Television, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In the United States, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, has been and continues to be the most popular book in all of human history. But the English translation of the Bible is very recent. The first full English translation of the 66 books of the Bible was the Coverdale Bible, translated in 1535 by scholar Miles Coverdale. The effort was dedicated to Aeneo Bolian, one of King Henry's eight wives. There have been countless scholars across time who have tackled the clusters of numbers that emerge from the sea of Ezekiel's visions in chapters 40 to 47. But you know, the truth is we may never know what God is showing us until we have the right calculator. That'll come when Christ comes for sure. The mind of Christ is the mind that understands God and his calculations. From the book of Samuel, we know that God doesn't look on the outward appearances, but looks on the heart of man. So it is possible that Ezekiel is seeing a structure that can only be interpreted with a not yet revealed component of the end times, something the Holy Spirit will do. Now this is not giving up on the problem of Ezekiel's measurements, but waiting on the Lord to reveal. One of the reasons I believe Janice that we become entangled in the numbers mm -hmm. is this, that we don't want to wait upon the Lord. I remember a great preacher who I was listening to. Some may know who he is, J. Vernon McGee. And uh, we, we like running his radio program uh, through the Bible. And J. Vernon McGee mentioned one time that he had to read the Bible and wait for a number of years before he truly understood this one thing mm -hmm. that the Lord was doing. And so rather than conjecture our own ideas about what the scripture means, sometimes God makes us wait. That's right. true. He makes us, maybe it's the 18th time through the Bible or whatever, but God makes us wait to reveal that to us. So keep that in mind, beloved. Don't give up on reading the Bible. <laughs> Read it every year. Bible challenge, Corey, you're up. And Corey's not giving up, and neither are you. Here's the question. What was carved throughout the temple all around? Pomegranates and cherubim, palm trees and lions, or palm trees and cherubim. Okay. My memory really has escaped me here, but right. I tried to reason it out because I know pomegranates were in the original temple, but I think they were just used as decorations, not as carving. So I'm going to go with palm trees 
and cherubim. Very good. Really? Very good. Very, very. <laughs> Ezekiel 41, verses 18 through 26. Read it and check it out. It says that they were all the way around, all throughout the temple. Well, we need your help, and uh, if you can help us, that would be great. One lady recently wrote to us, and she said, I've been watching your program for 10 years, and it never occurred to me to pray. And uh, she prayed about it, and God spoke to her to give for the first time in 10 years. And so she's chosen to give $10 a month. Well, that just thrills my heart. Thank you so much. Listen to me carefully. Whatever the amount is, make sure God gives it to you and not man. Make sure God gives it to you and not your own ideas. God has a plan for those who are called to support this ministry. Do what he says. I trust the work of the Holy Spirit in you. But you have to pray about it to hear from God. So would you do that? We're looking for 500 new partners in the next few months to support the ministry. Thank you for praying in advance. And one way you can support us is by praying for these people with their prayer requests. Watch and pray. much involved in the UFO cult movement. He was a member of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and many others, and, and he studied it and even worshipped the so-called aliens one night he was being tortured. He felt he was being abducted, levitating over his bed, terrified, marks on him. And he remembered something in Sunday school, and he was absolutely desperate. He thought he was going to die. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, release me. And you know those so-called aliens who were disguised demons, let go of him. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ and they never bothered him again. You can read his testimony. It so affected him that he started an entire ministry to help people be delivered from these demonic forces. That's the power of Jesus Christ. Do you know that power? Are you being tortured by demons? Jesus Christ. Come to him and he will set you free from that torture. I must tell you, I love this new quick study mobile application, which is in fact the Bible guide. Now, if you would like to find out how to get it, a donation in any amount online, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, it's going to take you direct to the page and you can download it right now at this second. Consider giving at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.